Welcome to the New Church Podcast. Okay. Here we go again. Um, I guess we should start off by reading a passage. This is from 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Father, thank you for your word. We ask that you would enlighten us as we turn to it now in Jesus' name. So, welcome to a new calendar year, Christian. Of course, the church here started back in Advent, but, you know, the world's always a little behind. We face, as you probably uh, have ascertained, even without the help of that very instructional video we just saw, uh, we face a plethora of problems in this calendar year, like pretty much do in every year. Jesus said we Christians are supposed to be salt and light in the world in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You're the light of the world and all that. Um, We're supposed to preserve and enlighten the world. And the question is, how so? I mean, how do we fix our radically divided populace? Uh, how about political evil, which doesn't matter which way you're looking at it. There's a lot of that going down the pike. Is there an answer to the educational quagmire? Um, is there a solution to the divide between so-called science and faith? What about divided families in a nation where you know, uh, half of our marriages end up in divorce. Lots of, lots of stuff out there that we can be salt and light about. And answers to these questions that I asked uh, can be found in the Bible. We already looked at it once. Well, let's look at it again. Second Timothy three, sixteen through 17. We read it earlier, right? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, which is to say what you should believe, what you're doing wrong, um, how to fix what's wrong, and how to do what is right. And it says this, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And we just read that a few minutes ago. Every good work, like being salt and light and answering those questions about how to address all those problems that I mentioned a minute ago, but to really begin to do so, we have to have some sort of grasp on the basic things of what we as believers are supposed to do in the world in the first place. Uh, Like a basic question about the so-called balance between the secular and the spiritual, which is a perennial question amongst uh, believers, especially evangelical believers. Most evangelicals live in a sort of a spiritual conundrum, conflicted over an attempt to balance so-called, quote, secular, what they consider to be necessary uh, world actions, and so-called spiritual works, a kind of a losing and hopeless attempt to meet some shifting criteria and legalistic kind of ideas about that. The what's called the dualist pietist belief that reality is split, which is why it's called dualism, between wickedness and evil, and then there's a spiritual category, and then there's a secular or worldly action, is frequently buttressed by appeals to scripture. People say, well, sure, everybody knows this. Everybody knows that the world is split between secular actions spiritual actions, right, and uh, so forth. So how do I, 
I mean, everybody knows that, right? It's in the Bible. Are there biblical passages that they apply correctly in interpretation when they say this? This is important, guys, because people ask this question all the time. How do I live spiritually? How do I live as a Christian in the world? What is it that's actually spiritual and what's not spiritual? And most of the time, the ideas that we have about this don't actually come from the Bible. They come from ideas that people have that they come up with in light of the, of the fact that they viewed the world as this radically split place. Normally make it into three categories, right? What's holy, what's not holy, and then what's mm, grayish in between. <clears throat> so a lot of time and energy spent, not only individually, not only in our families, not only in our churches or our schools or our political arena or whatever, because all those questions swirl around that for Christians. Swirl around that. And the question is, how do I be salt and light if I don't really have a grasp on what the world is like? It's a problem. It's one of the reasons why the church is such a powerhouse in our society today. Because we spend much of our time confused. Right? So... Um, I want us today to look at some typical passages that are quoted to support this idea that the world is a split place. The suspicion of bodies, you know, our bodies, and the material world and things associated with it find a lot of their origin in the interpretation of passages in the Bible, such as the one we first read, 1 John 2, 15, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 28, Philippians 3, 20, Colossians 3, 1 through 2, and 1 Peter 2, 11, and so forth, a number of these passages. So today our text, which we read at the top of, the, of this talk, is 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And many times across the church's history, this passage has been interpreted to mean don't value the regular works or actions of this life because those works, actions, fashions, beauty, bodily sensations, and so forth. And in fact, I've heard this quoted disparagingly to me concerning my long hair back in the day. Instead of those things, you have to value heavenly things. Prayer, worship, evangelism, Bible study, and so forth. So we ask ourselves, is this a legitimate interpretation of this verse? Obviously, uh, the interpretation here turns on the word world, both for world itself and for the phrase things of the world. The Greek word for world is the word cosmos, um, and which is used in various ways in the Bible and in the contemporary Greek culture of the day when, uh, when the Bible was inspired. For instance, in Homer, the Greek poet, and later, it means an apt and harmonious arrangement, order, or government. Like when we say, that makes a world of difference, or man, he's in for a world of hurt. Right? It can mean, as it does in 1 Peter 3, 3, ornament, adornment, or decoration, or even the universe, or the world around us, like it does in Acts 17:24. Romans 4.13, Philippians 2.15, and other places. Cosmos can also mean the circle of the earth, or just the earth, as in Mark 16.15, and 1 Timothy 6.7, and Revelation 11.25, and so forth. Or it can even mean the human family, the inhabitants of the earth, as in Matthew 13.38, and John 1.20, 1 Corinthians 1.27, and so forth. All those are legitimate interpretations of the word world. It can also mean, as it most frequently does in the New Testament, the ungodly multitude, the whole mass of men alienated from God, hostile to the kingdom of God under the sway of the evil one. As it does in John 7, 7, John 14, 27, 1 Corinthians 1, 21, 2 Corinthians 7, 10, James 1, 27, you get the idea, on and on and on. As a matter of fact, that's the predominant meaning of world in the Bible. And the last definition is essentially what is normally called the world 
system, that part of the world that still lies, uh, as John writes about in 1 John 5, 19, that lies under the sway of the evil one and resists Christ and his will and rule. Right? Uh, Satan and his minions control a certain amount of the world and they inspire resistance to obedience to God, not only in individuals, but in institutions like the family and the state and so forth and so on. And lo and behold, this is almost certainly what world means here in 1 John 2.15. So how do I know this, you say? Well, I, I do a kind of a trick. I read the next two verses in 1 John 2, verses 16 through 17. They come right after that, which says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So what is all that is in the world, as it says in verse 16? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, which are not of the Father, but are of the world. It is the satanically dominated and perverse twisting of the originally good world. How do I know that the world was originally good? Because Genesis 1.31 says that when God made everything, all along the way in Genesis 1, he keeps saying, this is good, this is good. At the very end, he says, and it was all very good. I know that because of what the world was like originally, because the Bible tells me that. Okay? So, but... The twisting of the originally all-good world <clears throat> under Satan's misrule generates perversions of human nature and the senses in the fallen nature of mankind. Illegitimate desires are less of the body and the mind, you know, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and foundless pride of life, which mirrors Satan's own original and overweening pride. As a matter of fact, Isaiah 14 will tell you that the seven things that Satan said that he would do, that he would be equal with God, that he would be greater than God, and so forth and so on. All about pride. The flesh, the Greek word is sarx, by the way, is used extensively by Paul to mean the same thing, a synonym for the old man, our old nature. And Paul uses it that way in Romans 7.18, Romans 8.1, uh, Romans 8.4, through five and so forth and so on, which is why it is the source of lust here, the lust of the flesh. Just as the fallen mind of man takes the sensory input of the eyes and has illegitimate desires concerning what he sees. He sees these things or experiences these things sensually and he wants to do, fallen man does, what he wants to do with it, not what God tells him should be done with it. Right? And this is all in the context of the world system. So, then there's Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, reading or hearing this, it's easy to draw the conclusion that anything associated with the earth is inferior to things in heaven. And thus that working on engine design or watching television or kissing your spouse or teaching mathematics and so forth are far beneath praying or reading the Bible or evangelizing. But uh, this would certainly mesh with dualist assumptions about piety, about what's spiritual. And these heavenly actions, quote, are actions associated with the advance of the kingdom of God. And they're good, and they're necessary actions in one's Christian life. You should pray, you should read the Bible, you should evangelize. But are these works of prayer, scripture study and evangelization, which after all are actions undertaken on the earth, by humans with physical bodies, what Paul has in mind in these comments in Colossians 3, 1 through 4? Well, looking on in that very passage, verses 5 through 10 tell us 
Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, or therefore your members that are on the earth, as King Jaime puts it. And it lists them, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once wore, uh, walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So what Paul is telling us to not set our minds on things of the earth, and that uh, Greek word is epige, are fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, and idolatry in verse 5, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language in verse 8, lying in the deeds of the old man in verse 9. And in fact, Paul identifies this list of sins as being the same as things on the earth, which we wrote about in verse 2. Things we're not supposed to set our minds on since he uses the same phrase in Greek, the word epige, things on the earth, in verse 5, which begins that list of earthly things, of sins, which Paul goes on to catalog in verses 5 through 8. These things, these sins, Paul goes on to say in verse 9, are deeds of the old man. This is the same term that Paul uses, for instance, in Ephesians 4.22, where he writes that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. This is the old sinful nature, the part of us that continues its war against our obedience to God, as Paul describes in Romans 7, 14 through 25, the same sin nature he writes of in Romans 6, 6. And Romans 6, 6 says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Our sin nature, our old man, is the result of the twisting of human nature in the fall when humanity was captured by Satan's world system, captured as the things of the earth, producing sins of the type Paul catalogs back in Colossians 3, 5 through 9, the old man whose sin and power has been crucified with Christ, as Paul taught in Romans 6, 6, which has freed us that we should no longer be slaves to sin, as it says in that same passage. And in fact, in Colossians 3, in verses 10 through 14, Paul teaches us by contrast with earthly things, which is in verses 2 and 5, the heavenly things, which he ties to the new man who produces virtues and sanctification. As Paul writes in verses 9 through 14, do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. There's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So the works meant to be produced by the new man, the new regenerated nature, brought into being by the Holy Spirit's application of the redemptive work of Christ are, as it says in verse 12, tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, or patience. And verse 13, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, and putting on love, which is the bond of perfection. In verse 14, <clears throat> these are the heavenly things, virtues flowing from the heavenly rebirth, which are presented as the opposite of the earthly things the sins which flow from the sin nature. The earthly things in this passage are not normal activities or works. They are sins, perversions, 
of the good spawned by our old man, the fallen nature that's enthralled to that world, the world system. Okay. Um, the heavenly things are not only special kingdom activities or works like prayer, Bible study, evangelism, but they're the normal virtues produced by the new man, the regenerate nature produced by the Holy Spirit. This is uh, no defense or scriptural justification of dualism or pietism in Colossians 3, 1 through 14. This is simply a call to holiness and sanctification across the board. And in point of fact, this looks at every part of our life, every part of our life, as being, if it flows from the regeneration and so forth, spiritual. There's not a split between so-called heavenly works and earthly works, except the division between sinfulness and obedience to God, which is what these verses are talking about. Right? Now, this is a shocking thought, I know, to some of y'all. The text itself, you can put this up, the text itself defines its terms. The context of the passage explains clearly what the text actually means. Colossians 3, 1 through 14. I know this is shocking to some people. Do you actually should read the whole passage and understand what's actually being said rather than one verse being taken out and attempted to uh, justify all kinds of weird stuff that's not actually in that passage? I know it's shocking. It's shocking that the Bible would actually explain itself. That seems terribly difficult for some people to grasp. And I understand that in most churches, not so much here. But in most churches, you know, you might hear one verse taken out or two verses taken out and explained and put in some kind of a structure that says that life is split. But that's not what the Bible says. It's not what it says at all. I know, radical concept. This is also buttressed by letting Scripture interpret Scripture. And here it comes, which you're all waiting for. Read your freaking Bible. <laughs> you can't let Scripture interpret Scripture unless, you know, you've read Scripture. That's not rocket science. But not only are you supposed to read it, you're supposed to actually try to understand what it's saying about itself as it goes along. Shocking. Hmm. Well, then, in speaking of things passing away, what about 2 Corinthians 4.18? Doesn't it promote dualism by valuing the eternal over the temporal? Well, let's look at it. We do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Well, that's pretty straight ahead. Uh, isn't this just a prime example of Paul's dualism? Isn't he saying that the things seen are not worth as much as the eternal unseen things, since the, scenes, the things that we see now are only temporary? Well, yes and no. This guy named Michael Whitmer wrote a book called Worldly Saints. And in commenting on this passage, he says that he uh, has, as have I, heard pastors preaching this, saying there are only two things that last forever, the word of God and souls. Everything else is going to burn, so live for what matters most. Ignore all that other stuff. And another preacher who said, you will not be in heaven two seconds before you cry out, why did I place so much importance on things that were so temporary? What was I thinking? Why did I waste so much time, energy, and concern on what wasn't going to last? And Whitmer goes on to make a joke humorously to say he'd never heard a balding uh, middle-aged man lament the many hours that he washed his hair as a teenager, or a weary mother mourn the fact that her family ate all of her Christmas dinner. I worked all morning on my ham dinner, and now it's gone. What a waste. Many things that don't last forever are still worth their time. True enough, especially since what Paul is talking about is not dualism. No? So, what is he talking about? Well, surprise, surprise, 
To find out, we have to look at the context. Right? Let's go back up in the chapter to 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 through 12 and 16, 17. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power of God and not of us we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Kind of puts a different spin on that passage, right? Because it's more than, you know, one of those posters with kittens on it that has one verse on it. What is seen in temporary are the effects of the fall and the world system on Paul. Persecution, sins of the wicked against the righteous, uh, and the desiccation of the body, suffering. His outward man is perishing in his sight. What is unseen is the fullness of redemption, which, as the Spirit uses Paul's suffering, to produce an eternal weight of glory, as he says in verse 17, when Paul and the cosmos will be delivered from sin, evil, and suffering, as evil is removed from the world and from Paul at doomsday, as the world is renewed in Christ. So what is temporary is the effect of sin, the fall, and the world system on the world. What is eternal is the removal of evil and the restoration of our bodies and the cosmos, which will last forever. Your body will last forever, guys. All this stuff about your soul just inhabiting a body is platonic, pagan nonsense. You are not only your spirit, you are your body as well. And what Jesus died to do is not just save your soul, but to raise you from the dead as he is, with a body that has been transformed into what it was always intended to be. Don't despise your body, guys. That's pagan and heretical. Right? It's the resurrection that ends our salvation, which we're still in. Again, no conflict between this worldly and otherworldly actions. No dualism here, but just the juxtaposition of sin and its effects on the one hand and righteousness on the other hand. Well, then there's 1 Peter 2.11. Behold, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Now, many duelists take this passage as a mandate for us to not see ourselves as residents of the world, since Christ's kingdom must therefore be somewhere else. But again, what does the passage actually say? We are sojourners and strangers, to the world system which produces the fleshly lust which war against the soul. We are to be moral aliens to the world system and its wickedness, but not to the world of the kingdom that is coming. When Jesus walked on the earth, he says, the kingdom has come among you. And we are not to despise that. Which leads us to another Putative dualist proof text. Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So some say, see, we don't belong here, and we shouldn't be taken up with anything in this world, by which they mean anything. However, our citizenship has, here has to do with our allegiance, our loyalty, and our spiritual origin, not where we live. We are citizens of the kingdom of God whose function and goal is to restore not only us to a relationship with God, but the world around us as the effects of the kingdom spread. Folks, even if we're in another country like, you know, California or Russia, 
we're still citizens of Texas, right? You don't stop being a citizen of Texas because you're in California. I mean, you may pray more or something, but, you know. This is even more clearly seen in the next verse in Philippians 3, verse 31. Okay? Our citizenship's in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. All of which refers to the resurrection, the restoration, the regeneration of all things, as Jesus speaks about in Matthew 19, 28 and Acts 3, 21. It would appear that Christ is somewhat concerned with our bodies. Right? That's what it just says. We're just saying. In relation to all this, Jesus made a very illuminatory series of statements in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 15 through 18, where Jesus says, I do not pray that you should take them out of this world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, or you could also translate that from the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into this world, I also have sent them into the world. It doesn't exactly sound like somebody's running from the world there, I would think. The Lord Jesus, who came from heaven to impact and change this world, right, sends us into the world to do the same. Doesn't look like cutting and running to me. Doesn't look like not engaging. But it does teach that we're supposed to engage that world in such a way that the evil of it, the world system, is overcome and displaced. Jesus, who says he's not from the world system, also indicates that neither are the people of him, the ones he's redeemed from the world system. In verse 16, since they were born from above, as John 3.31 says, we, like him, are not of this world. However, Jesus has sent us out to minister to those in the world system, just like the Father sent Jesus to do. The truth is that both works of creation, the regular things that we do living in this world, which God caused us sovereignly to be born into as humans, and the works of the kingdom, preaching of the gospel, the spread of the kingdom and so forth, are equally spiritual in themselves. Since the kingdom's goal is to restore the creation through and on the basis of the redemptive work of Jesus, and any true balance of creation and kingdom works must be sought in the interstices of our calling and our leadings, dependent on our ongoing discipleship with Christ. It's difficult to know what spirituality is if you don't know what the Bible defines as sin and righteousness. And folks, there's all kinds of weird uh, legalistic stuff that has been added into an idea of what spirituality is that doesn't come from the Bible. It's been adopted from pagan ideas about the world, like the thing about you not being a body as well as a soul and spirit. That's not biblical. But you know, you see all kinds of, go to a funeral, you hear some of the dumbest stuff you've ever heard. Plato would be proud because it ain't in the Bible. There is no metaphysical, no split in the world. There's only an ethical one. Do we do right or do we do wrong in the world that God has redeemed us in and put us in to preach the gospel and live out a godly life? As the world system twists the good world to Satan's perverse purposes, which is opposed by the kingdom of God, which advances to drive back the dark kingdom. You are the light of the world. It's almost like the Holy Spirit set up that image to describe what actually is. I know, it's a shocking thought. There are no dualistic Bible passages at all. So why do we misunderstand them so easily? And really, there's several reasons. One is, you know what I'm going to say, we don't know the Bible. 
So we can't allow the Bible to interpret the Bible if we don't. So other passages concerning the same things can't help condition our interpretation. Right? Because a particular book of the Bible is a context, but all the books of the Bible together are another context. Right? The Bible interprets the Bible. If you don't know the Bible, guys, you're a sitting freaking duck. Not intelligent. We're supposed to love the Lord of God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the mind thing gets left out all the time. Most every one of us knows all kinds of stuff about what we do, whether we teach school or a mechanic, or we, you know, kill organisms in houses or or what. And most of us spend hours of our days thinking about what our particular vocation is and so forth. A legitimate thing. But then maybe we spend 15 minutes praying if we're really in a spiritual mood. And we don't read the Bible much at all. That's one of the reasons why, you know, we've, we have here the program of reading through the Bible. You've got to know the Bible, guys. Or you're going to get your sack lunch eaten which means we're going to get our sack lunch eaten. Paul says every part of the body supplies what is lacking for the whole body. So if you're asleep at the wheel, it's trouble for all of us and your family and your loved ones and the political system and the schools and so forth and so on. Also, we don't actually consider, as I've uh, I thought very delicately, uh, emphasized the context of the verse of the verses in the passages, which as we've seen frequently outright describe or limit what is being discussed. We import all this stuff that we get from, you know, PBS or something into what the Bible says instead of doing it the other way around. But guys, if you don't know the Bible, you can't critically engage the world system you're going to assume that what the world system says is true. Most Christians, what they think about education doesn't depend a lick on the Bible. They got it from some pagan who didn't even believe in God. Right? Most of our ideas about politics and so forth and so on, we think, well, that's Ali Ali awesome Frey. The Bible has very particular things to say about all these things. And if you don't know what that is, you're going to get your sack lunch eaten, and we're all going to get our sack lunch, and we are getting our sack lunch eaten. Right? The questions I asked up top, they'll have to do with this. What is spiritual? What is your life supposed to look like? What are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to think not only about these big issues, but about the very vocation you're called to do, whether you're a housewife or an accountant? We, uh, what is the phrase he uses in the scripture? We lay on our couches while the city burns. All right? Another thing, we don't know the creeds, which are handy summarizations of the central core biblical teachings on the Trinity and the Incarnation and so forth. And consequently, we haven't considered the implications of those core teachings so that creation, fall, redemption, consummation, can't keep us grounded, preventing our importing alien assumptions into the text, like this idea that the world is split somehow metaphysically in its essence. The world is split because people choose evil because they are fallen and in bondage to the world system. But you saw what I read about how the old man, right, has been, we've taken off the old man and put on the new man who is renewed in his understanding as the Holy Spirit regenerated us. It's the zone we're supposed to live in, guys. It's how we're supposed to live our lives. So, let's don't do those things. Not doing that will allow the implications of the scripture and its doctrines to keep us grounded on the biblical Trinitarian, incarnational, covenantal, creational kingdom concepts and help us to balance our lives and rejecting those false pagan ideas, follow God's will as we should, 
not only advancing our own individual sanctification, not even just advancing the sanctification of this church body or the church bodies everywhere. And yes, Virginia, there is corporate sanctification as well. That's why we, that's why we, you know, make those vows and stuff when we join the church. Because we are all in this together, whether you want to be or not. There's no Lone Ranger thing. You've heard that a zillion times, and it's actually true. Your sanctification, your individual sanctification, your family's sanctification, the church's sanctification, the advance of the kingdom depends on not just your individual sanctification, but our sanctification as a body and the sanctification of the church as a whole over time. Right? But that means you got to stop looking at Christianity as a compartment. Everything that you are and do exists within this huge global expanse of Christianity and what Scripture teaches. You don't turn to Christianity on Sunday. Everything you do should be thought out and prayed out and done so in light of what you've read in the Scripture and what the Holy Spirit leads you to understand in that. Otherwise, you're not going to be salt and light. Jesus says if the salt loses its flavor, it's not good for anything but to be thrown out. And if the lamp is under a basket, it doesn't give its light. Right? The way to keep the flavor, the way to continue to shine is to read Scripture, understand it, and do what is written. So, if you're up to doing some uh, resolutions, a good one would be to read your freaking Bible. I'm just saying. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the fact that you have spoken to us in your word and that your word leads us into truth and light, makes us free, pleases you, and does all the things that you desire your people to do and be. Have mercy on us, Lord, and give us gumption. Help us do what you have called us to do. Help us to be your people and be a light, to be salt in the earth. We ask that you would visit us with these ideas, cause us to remember them, and that you would lead us into the fullness of your life by your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. For more information, go to newchurch.love or email frank at frankheart.com. If these online resources have been meaningful to you, please consider going to newchurch.love slash give and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you.